Well, hello everyone. It is Black Mountain Talks, and today we are proudly presenting you Andrei Martyanov, who is an expert in on Russian military and naval issues, and he was born in Baku, USSR, graduated from Kirov Naval Red Banner Academy, and served as an officer on the ship staff uh, position of Soviet Coast Guard. And now he is uh, living in in the U U.S. and he is an author of books uh, like "Losing Military Supremacy" and "The Real Revolution in Military Affairs." Uh, Andre, we are very happy to see you here. My pleasure. And, yeah. So, and we have a lot of questions to you, but I think the most uh, important question today it is like Tucker's Carlson interview and reaction to this interview because. Uh, Oh, well, not to exaggerate, but I think the whole world was watching it and the whole world was waiting for it. And what are your comments on this topic? Oh, very simple. I mean, um, honestly, I didn't comment on this yet. I just opened the open thread on my blog and let people go at it. But I think so. It's uh, extremely important. And it is the process of the how to put it away, uh, put it uh, in a simpler terms, demolition of the corporate uh, legacy media because they have been exposed as the propaganda machine and nothing more. And obviously you can, uh, this is apart from the other issues which uh, it's irresist warranted and irresistible comparison between Mr. Biden and Mr. Putin. In terms of mental state and in terms of how people present themselves, style and you know clarity of thought. So in, in this particular respect, it's just absolutely important. And uh, fact is, it could be in some sense the start of the turning point, if you wish. But again, uh, apart from the geostrategic issues which have been covered by President Putin, and uh, if you listen and read to my friends today, like Scott Ritter or Larry Johnson and people uh, like that, the issue, of course, was that, as I already stated, for me personally, it is most important that it's uh, the contrast, uh, like the antibiotic, which have been introduced to the, into the infection against the corporate legacy media in the West, exposing them for what they are. They are liable on, in, for example, crimes against humanity and war crimes, their propaganda machine, and now it's becoming clear. Yeah, and there was a good joke in Russia, well, in, on Russian Telegram, that if you don't like Putin to be interviewed by Tucker Carlson, we can advise Solovyov to be taking interview from Biden at the same yeah. time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I think we can move on to next topic. I think Mike has questions now to uh, our guest. Mike, you're welcome. Yeah, thank you. Well, uh, yeah, it's Andrew. So it, it was a long time since we talked together uh, with uh, my Krupa, uh, Krupa's channel. Um, I'm glad you're here and good to see you. Good to uh, see you. So yeah, yeah. This 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 interview was uh, particularly inter um, interesting because uh, it was uh, intended for for the Western audience. Uh, we know the Russian history. We, we uh, but he didn't say anything uh, unusual, anything uh, anything new that uh, for the people, let's say from the from the Eastern Europe or from the former Soviet Union. But uh, that uh, that his approach to history, how he uh, for I think about forty five minutes, he he talked about in uh, deep. So it's going almost thousand years. Uh, that was uh, years behind. So, what do you think? Uh, uh, should it be maybe a little bit shorter, or it was actually a good lesson to, so that people who are not familiar, so that they can learn the finally learn the stuff? Well, Tucker in the beginning uh, stated that at first he thought it was a filibustering, mm -hmm. but then in twenty, it was twenty-five minutes. His introduction to Russian history. So, I think so. It was warranted. I found no. <clears throat> evidently by the reaction of the people I observed today all across the, you know, this worldwide web, you know, internet, uh, it was totally fine with them, you know, mm -hmm. and people actually appreciated this. But even Tucker said, but after that, well, you know, the more he continued with the history, he understood that, uh, yeah, it was totally warranted and he was, yeah, it was totally genuine. So mm -hmm. it's not nothing wrong with that. 
Yeah. It's, uh, it's interesting how President Putin actually knows the, knows that uh, those details and how he, he talk about that. He's really, really deep uh, in, into the history, uh, besides he's also an intelligence officer. But uh, he really knows his stuff. And he, he presented that on an amazing way, uh, I, I would say. Very simple, but very, um, very, very strong. Well, he, uh, if you look at his history, obviously, and considering the fact that he is a graduate of the Red Banner Institute, which is, was known as Andropov Institute. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, it's a, a, an academy of the foreign intelligence. He was obviously director of FSB before he became the prime minister. So the guy has a background. You know, mm -hmm. he also grew up in uh, Leningrad. And mm -hmm. as you might understand, the city, although very young by Russian standard, steeped in tradition and heroism and tragedy. So mm -hmm. it affects you. And of course, yeah, when you grow up in this uh, cultural environment, surrounded by the incredible art culture, you know, the uh, and St. Petersburg is just unrivaled pretty much, you know. And uh, yeah, you, you got, you're going to know a lot of things about Russian history. And uh, so now when he's a president and, of course, the way he and his uh, reference and his AIDS work and uh, combined with his background, educational and uh, professional background, there you go. You have the statesman and he presents himself as a statesman. Yeah, it was funny uh, yesterday also when President Biden sh uh, show up for uh, for uh, his um, I don't even know how to call that. He, it, <laughs> when you when you compare <laughs> compare that, yeah, really, it, it is not good to, to <laughs> laugh with how one uh, I know. old man do that. I mean, with, with respect to his age, but can't be compared. Uh, really, it was not. I couldn't even call it a disaster. President Biden. Yeah, well, it is a disaster. We know what is going on there. But that's what uh, I spoke uh, about literally five minutes ago when I stated that. it's uh, It should be the end of the legacy media who are complicit in the what is happening now de demonstrably mm -hmm. in front of all public. Uh, in fact, it's a manifest. It's almost deliberate. Abuse of the old man. However corrupt and bad he is, and he is corrupt, his whole family is just some kind of the criminal syndicate or whatever. But, I mean, his place is not even in jail. His place in the senior facility. Yeah. He's been take, uh, taking care of nursing home. Yeah. With yes. a high-level nursing home. But that's where he belongs. And yet those people continue to convince everybody that, you know, what well, he's fine. You know, look at him. He's, you know, just... So... That is a, a, it is a complete disgrace. I mean, it is so uh, unacceptable. And especially mm -hmm. when you talk about that the uh, United States still is the nuclear superpower. Mm -hmm. And the guy carries with this, you know, this uh, nuclear football with him, you know. Yeah, yeah. So it's just like, you know what people obviously, and Putin stated yesterday, which everybody understands who is not completely brainwashed in the combined West, that actually Biden is just merely a figurehead yeah. for the most part. He is run by the cabal of the neocons in his administration. Mm -hmm. It is also Obama administration, former Obama administration, utterly incompetent people on any matter of their uh, statesmanship. So... There you go, and as a result, we have this catastrophe essentially a yeah. disaster. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, so yeah, but uh, th this interview is going to ring through the through the ages, I would say. Um, I check it was 140 million almost uh, of views, and uh, it's it's unbelievable. Uh, we are we are witnessing uh, something uh, very very unusual in the modern uh, modern time. Well, it's uh, 140 mi million on uh, uh, Tucker's platforms. Yeah, Tucker's right. platforms. Have platforms which are not counted, and you get into right. like some platform which is bang 300,000 people, and it's not views, yeah. and yeah. it's not even Tucker, you know, it's somebody else just streaming it from Tucker. Yeah, and it's of course now begins to live in its own life in, uh, on for example, YouTube. And yes, I mean, it's uh, it's a very important uh, geopolitical statement from Russian side made by President Putin. And uh, obviously, 
it it is a shock for many people mm -hmm. it's not going to change minds of people who are completely mm -hmm. and you know strategically so to speak positioned into the corner mm -hmm. of neocons and again there are no uh, professionals real professionals in foreign policy and military strategy who are in Biden administration but it's not going to change their mind but at least the message has been conveyed has been conveyed and many people understood it and that matters in the long run because it changes public opinion slowly. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So let let the other side other side speak. Pretty, it's fair enough. Lena. Yeah. So uh, I I would have uh, two questions: one for for you, Andre, and one uh, for you, Mike, um, regarding the interview. So let's start with Andre. Um, what do you think, uh, or who do you think was the real? Um, target of this um, interview, who are the targeted people? Um, Putin, um, as it seemed, uh, tried to deliver a message. So he prepared carefully um, a history lesson for half an hour, which was very important. I mean, the information was very important. But as we all know, uh, the, uh, the um, the Western people don't like to listen too long to history. Um, who will receive the mes message, and who is uh, a, uh, who did he aim for? I mean, broadly to the Western public, obviously, <clears throat> but it was also was the message to the so-called political elite or governing elites in the West, and um, it was implied actually then that. You know what? Here's the ball in your corner. Do whatever you want to do with it. Russia is moving basically the way she moves now. And it doesn't matter what you do unless you come to the table. And then we will yes. discuss the conditions for the surrender. That's pretty yeah. much it. Definitely, yeah. 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 Yes. So, um, Mike, the next one goes uh, to you. Um, Putin said at one point, and it was very interesting for me, um, he said uh, that Yeltsin, uh, back when Belgrade was bombed, and you were bombed as well at this time, you were one of the guys that received these bombs, um, uh, Putin said that President Yeltsin understand, understood everything at this time. Mm -hmm. And um, I can't make sense out of this. Uh, what is your opinion? And Andre, if you have an opinion, you can also uh, add. Yeah. Well, well uh, President uh, Yeltsin, uh, he knew about that. He knew uh, he had a background because, of course, uh, intelligence services, they, they serve him information. But uh, <laughs> bear in mind, it was the uh, end of 1990s. Russia was weak. Russia, Russia was weak, so the, there is nothing that the Russia can really do except uh, do some political support or maybe send us uh, some very, very light uh, light uh, weapons. But um, uh, when President Putin said, yeah, well, Yeltsin was aware, of course, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, that um, that uh, moving of uh, company of paratroopers, the Sankinki, from Bosnia to, to Pristina Airport, uh, it was actually um, ordered from the high... Uh, mm -hmm from the high level, I believe. So that was that was something that actually helped us. So at least we, we knew that we are not completely alone. And I will also uh, also praise the president, uh, Lukashenko, because he was the one who came to Belgrade. And he, he came uh, uh, during, during, during the bombing, not, not exactly during the bombing raids, but uh, NATO planes were in the air at, at that time. So People knew that, but you know, uh, um, geopolitical situation in uh, end of 1999 was uh, was uh, completely different than it was now. Uh, Russia was weak. We all uh, know that 1990s were extremely hard, so Russia was uh, in in very very bad uh, situations. So uh, um, I mentioned uh, yesterday on another interview that if situation is uh, 99 is like today, that we have a really really strong Russia. It will be a completely different story. So NATO will never, NATO will never, never do what uh, what they have done to us on, uh, in uh, 1999. And uh, I also mentioned that uh, if we have just one percent of the stuff that that Ukraine uh, is uh, Ukraine had in February 2022, it will, they will never attack us. Not even mentioning uh, how much uh, how much support they they getting from the Western countries. 
just one percent, and it will never be never be war in 1999. But you know, the times changing, so it it, it it was different time. President Yeltsin uh, inherited Russia in a very uh, very very bad time, so he, he has done what whatever he was in his power. He was not not a brilliant leader, I could I can say that, and he he made a lot uh, a lot of mistakes. But that was the almost like a childbirth of, of the of the new uh, new country. So the Russia after that, the Russia rose, rose from the ashes. Russia is the that were left after the collapse of the Soviet Union, which I think is geopolitical uh, one of the largest ge- geopolitical uh, mistakes um, ever happened. Yes. So yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I will come to the next question. Um, Andre, uh, I re- uh, just a second. So I remember very good. Um, it was maybe a year ago uh, when I listened to your podcast, and uh, <clears throat> you said back then uh, that there will be a tribunal where all the Western um, war criminals and so on uh, will be prosecuted, and I absolutely agree. And um, I was thinking all the time how is it possible how to get them to this tribunal now president putin spoke in this interview with tucker about denazification what is denazification and he said he is going to achieve it through negotiations first what is your opinion about achieving denazification through negotiations and second um how do you imagine that uh, the war criminals will be brought to justice Uh, the Ukrainian, so to speak, war criminals will be brought to justice by the means of FSB and Ministry of Internal Affairs and the Ross Guard. They will be caught and will be delivered. And we already know that the uh, tri- tribunal is being formed as we're speaking right now in Moscow. Yes. And there is actually there uh, uh, some person in, um, pardon me. Uh, no problem. Yeah, just let me. I don't know why this thing is. No problem. Yeah, and uh, there mm. is uh, some person in the Ministry of the Foreign Affairs in Russia who is responsible for uh, formation of this uh, tribunal. There is an ambassador in charge of that. So, pro Western uh, uh, war criminals, there are war criminals, there are people from the intelligence services and special services, especially from London and Washington, we're talking about CIA, MI6, and people of that nature, Mm -hmm. who are complicit in the crimes against humanity and war crimes, including, of course, attacks on the civilian objects, including the uh, basically execution of the civilians under their supervision. And there are other issues which are related to this, including shooting down, for example, what amounts to a civilian plane like it was in IL-76. This hasn't been done just by Ukrainians. It has been done yes. from basically uh, um, uh, permission of the people in Washington, D.C. Uh, on, uh, yes. So, And uh, there will be charges most likely leveled at them. Their names will be called. Their names will be stated in the open. I don't think so. They will be there, so to speak, closed, you know, uh, for the public uh, elaborations on this matter. And as the result, they would probably need to stay within the United States for now, you know, once it's kind of, you know, stated. And then, of course, the process starts uh, on how they should be, you know, handed to, you know, tribunal. Oh, will they yes. will they be handed? Obviously, it's the second issue. But what is most important, those people and their names will be called. They will be stated in the open. And after that, they should really kind of take care of themselves. Yes, I understand. Yeah, thank you. Um, the next question um, is for both. Um, uh, Mr. Putin said in this interview, um, if regular NATO troops enter Ukraine, it would be the start of World War III or something like this. And now we had uh, Medvedev several days ago. He said when NATO, NATO starts a war with Russia, then the response would be immediately nuclear. So I'm trying to bring both um, expressions uh, together. Um, I I think that Putin or Mr. Putin is referring to the en- entering of a single NATO nation into the war and 
Medvedev is referring to the whole NATO bloc into the war. Uh, what what is your opinion? Uh, you can choose who want to answer. Andrei, you, you go first. Oh, well, it's uh, two separate things, actually. Medvedev was talking about the issue, by the way, uh, there is a very specific uh, uh, clause in uh, first Russian military doctrine. And of course, there is the uh, algorithm, so to speak, described uh, in the many classified documents uh, of the operational strategic level of how you approach the nuclear threshold. The clause in the Russian military doctrine is very specific. When the war conducted by the conventional means uh, threatens the existence of the Russian state, then, of course, Russia can respond with the nuclear weapons. Medvedev was doing this merely to re remind people. It has actually, he a little bit pushed the envelope, which is not there, honestly. Yeah. But Putin was very specific that, no, he was talking not about one nation. He was talking even if the United, uh, United States, essentially, that's what NATO is, enters there uh, with its troops, as the Great Britain offered, uh, a, a few days ago with this expeditionary force, I don't know what will be the British expeditionary <laughs> force, like what, half a brigade of people who don't know who they, their gender. So the point, is, um, the point is that uh, Russia has the escalation dominance on a conventional way in terms of the uh, conventional war conducted by the unified NATO force especially Russia has the ability to interdict lines of communications which are critical in supplying well and even today it's not even that critical except for manpower because the United States is not the United States of World War II when they call themselves arsenal of democracy and could deliver a lot of supplies. Today it's absolutely not the case. So Putin was saying indeed about the conventional war if NATO wants to you know, introduce the troops in Ukraine. Once NATO introduced the troops in Ukraine, uh, all bets are off, and they are, uh, basically Russia can. Uh, Russia has the ability to conduct their uh, very large scale combined arms operations against the, uh, uh, let's say, the basing points and uh, the deployed forces already in NATO territory. And you have to understand, the algorithm is pretty simple. The only thing NATO can do is to try to, uh, uh, to, to inflict some kind of damage on Kaliningrad uh, area. There are some, you know, crazy people who think that it's possible. Once they try to do this, Brussels will be leveled together with their uh, NATO headquarters without any nuclear weapons. And that's the whole thing. And many people, for example, in Pentagon, on the operational level, all those, you know, colonels, you know, and um, brigadier generals, they do understand that. So it's well, Putin was actually specific, very specific in avoiding mentioning of the nuclear weapons. But Mr. Medvedev is the bad cop in the good <laughs> that uh, uh, tandem with Mr. Putin. So, and he is uh, allowed to be firebrand that he is, and he does it. Believe me, he does it sincerely. This is not some kind of the role he plays. He just, you know, he is that the kind of guy. So the uh, uh, NATO better pray that he doesn't become next president again. <laughs> you know, so because that would be well. It, <laughs> so and. Uh, <laughs> That's what is this all about. I don't see anything specifically dangerous or, or escalatory in those statements. It's just statements of the facts. And again, do not forget, uh, there are about, what, 400,000 Russian troops which hasn't been introduced yet to the uh, battlefield. And Russia can right. mobilize 2.2 million immediately if she needs. And she has the economic, military, industrial wherewithal to supply those people, arm and equip them. And this is not going to be good for NATO if they decide to do something stupid like that. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I would add uh, with this, um, uh, NATO, NATO troops are already in, in Ukraine. We're talking about uh, special forces. So British SAS, SBS, uh, uh, some special forces from France, uh, former, to say, uh, foreign legionnaires, which are very good trained in infantry tactics. So from Portugal, Portugal, Spain, Canada, of course, uh, Joint task force people are there, uh, and they're, they're providing uh, support. They are providing training, and they're conducting operations. So when I mentioned uh, French Foreign Legion, yeah, uh, of course there is a 
I think uh, 70% or 60% of French Polish indigenous are actually people from the East, Eastern Europe. So a lot of people from Ukrainian regions, and it, it's, it's simple. If they uh, if they, uh, if they uh, they can be ordered to go because French foreign legionnaire is doing what he's ordered to do. So if the French government and his command request his presence in uh, in Ukraine, of course he will go. He will change uniform. It's 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 not a big deal. Uh, French uniform will be changed uh, for Ukrainian uniform, and, and that's it. There are foreign volunteers, especially in, um, uh, recently talking about Colombians, uh, people from or other con- poor countries, that they, are, they they hope that they will be paid uh, to do the stuff. So Ukraine uh, be- became a mixed match of, 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 of everything. But uh, foreign, foreign uh, to, to call them representatives, uh, they're suffering casualties. When you look at the, uh, in, the uh, in the news uh, on the West, suddenly a lieutenant colonel in his uh, f- uh, mid 40s uh, die uh, unex- without any explanation, or helicopter crash here and there. That is the way how uh, how, how they are going to to cover that. Or uh, your general uh, crashed while uh, and died while uh, piloting uh, his uh, private uh, plane. Yeah, of course, it's uh, the stories are always there. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, casualties are happening, and uh, they are not easy uh, easy to swallow for NATO. Now, if uh, there there are plans, every military, every military, include uh, uh, performing the operational mm-hmm. and strategic uh, games to call it, to call that games. They are planning how they're going to uh, put the troops, how they're going to do supplies, and of course there is a plan. There is a plan to get into the uh, Lviv. There is a plan to go to Volin and the Western Ukraine. So. With, uh, which units are they going to be Polish brigades or it, it, it be mixed brigades? Or there is a plan how to, to how to defend uh, Baltic states uh, because uh, this is something that militaries are doing. But uh, uh, for now, it is just a, it is just a matter of plan of, of planning because the armies uh, and uh, general staffs they uh, they they are playing with uh, contingencies. Uh, uh, I, I, I can't agree more with Andre that Western military, especially U.S. military, is not the same military that they had 19, in 1945 or even 1991 when they invaded uh, Iraq. This is just a remnants of, of that stuff. And uh, I laugh when Andre said that uh, they don't know which gender, for instance, for the British military. <laughs> this is absolutely true. British military can be fit into the Wembley Stadium. Combat units can fit in, in, into the third third uh, third league uh, stadium. So uh, even if they on, on paper they are talking about unity, they're talking about uh, strength. Except air forces, air forces on those countries, land forces which need to go there, they need to uh, set foot in, in into Ukraine, and they will be first uh, exposed to uh, to, uh, to the to the Russian response. There is nobody who can do that. But I mean, we, we can talk about Estonian, Lithuanian, or Latvian uh, troops. Are they going to do anything? Let, let's be realistic. There is no chance that uh, it's going to happen. But plans exist. Plans exist. The military headquarters, they're doing uh, games. Uh, they're, they're planning what, uh, what kind of logistics they need, what, uh, what number of people they need. But also, uh, they need now, if they decide to do that, they have to play also with, with Belarus. And Belarus will, <laughs> will uh, react. Of course, because they uh, and also that uh, I think it's a Sumalaki corridor between Kaliningrad and, and Russia, Kaliningrad and, and Belarus. So that is that will be one of the uh, of the potential theaters for the military escalation. Uh, and as, as Andre said, if they just move uh, against Kaliningrad, there is no Warsaw, there is no Berlin, there is no uh, no Brussels. So it's of course in the plans they will do that. That's that's something that military is doing, but in reality, well, it's 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 quite uh, quite different. Yes, yeah. yes, I understand. Okay, thank you for that. Um, let's move to the next one. Uh, <laughs> this was very interesting for me um, during the interview. Uh, Pu- uh, Mr. Putin showed a few examples of previous empires' rise and fall. Uh, eventually, he said that today's processes are much uh, quicker than uh, the one of 500 years ago. And then he smiled, and Tucker smiled as well. Uh, Andre, can you interpret this? <laughs> What is your opinion about it? Uh, 
No, no, it's he's absolutely correct. It's uh, uh, dramatically increased in terms of speed because of the uh, speed of the exchange of the information. Today you get the instant information. We're speaking, you know, from different continents. You see, in the you know immediate responses, so to speak. So yeah, and because of the this incredible speed of the informational exchange, so yeah, things happen very fast. And uh, of course, we also have to keep in mind that um, even empires is kind of mm -hmm. like Russia def defines herself now not as empire, and Russians are not interested in the you know classic imp uh, empire business, you know, with the metropoly and those colonies. Russia is bizarre empire, so to speak. So it's uh, more like a civilization. So it's. Uh, but United States tried to be an empire and it failed at that very fast, really. So it's precisely because the situation changed and the dynamics, economic dynamics, scientific, industrial, what have you, uh, changed also dramatically. And now you have the nuclear weapons, which suppress outbursts of the, uh, which make war between uh, superpowers rather unlikely, okay? So, and that all factors in into the, the situation which we have today. What uh, American empire really existed primarily since the World War I, most, most of it anyway. And it's over for now because, you know, uh, the whole world actually is in the uprising. And it uh, relates not only to the United States, but to the combined West. Just to give you an example, Russia kicked out French out of the Sahel and, you know, in, from Africa. And Mr. Macron is right. suffering because of that. He's very bitter, and that's why he wants to inflict some pain on Russians. Well, good luck with that, you know, so. And there you go. So, yeah, it's really difficult to draw historical parallels nowadays. I always, I am on the record for years. When you draw historic parallels, you have to be very cautious because obviously the circumstances change dramatically and that changes the dynamic of, let's say, the um, fall of the empires. Uh, U.S. empire, yeah, let's say, existed for 100 years now. It's in the process of the dissolution. It's called... It used to be called Pax Americana, but the last colonies which United States has today, realistically, this is Europe. Yes, yes, Absolutely. of course. So um, thank you for that. Let's go to the next question. The next question is uh, again for both. And it's about Zaluzhny. Um, it looks like that he's now eventually um, sacked. I don't know. Sometimes he is, sometimes he isn't. But it looks like he is now. <laughs> and um, what are the implications going forward? Especially because um, Sierski was appointed. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's that's the. I, I consider it also funny because Sierski is known for his offensive, uh, for his failed offensive uh, operations where hundreds of thousand people, uh, Ukrainians, died. And I thought that the Ukrainians want to do some kind of defensive uh, operation, but how to do it with Sirsky? <laughs> it's impossible. So what are your, your thoughts, guys? Absolutely makes no difference whatsoever. So, and if, if anybody thinks that uh, actually Zalushny was much better, he was not. I mean, and, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> for, again, makes no difference who... Okay, just get the best generals from Pentagon and place them there, whatever the best is defined nowadays in the U.S. military, probably because they are, you know, bootlickers, you know, and uh, just want to pr promote their political careers. But it won't make any difference whatsoever because you look at the numbers and you look at the numbers not on a tactical but on operational level, which defines the combat effectiveness of the force as such and yeah whatever put napoleon there makes no difference so munstein <laughs> hey eric von munstein here's the example now get eric von munstein and put him in charge of the armed forces of ukraine even in the february 2022 he won't have been able to do much so there you go 
Yes. Yeah, it's it's just a uh, um, the the matter of, of names and the matter of of approach. Uh, so, uh, but you know, if the situation is good and everything is going well, nobody is going to change the key people, especially on the, on the top of the military. And behind all of those people, we are now uh, behind the Zaluzhny uh, and his staff uh, and uh, General Sivsky. There is a uh, there is other there are other people who are actually doing the planning. But this shake-up is uh, something that is going to change anything. Nothing is going to happen. I mean, um, because uh, uh, situation on, on, in the battlefield uh, is uh, something uh, that can be on, on this level, can be influenced. It can, but it shows that there is, a, there is a, some crisis within the Ukrainian leadership. So uh, now somebody said that, uh, I read somewhere, because the, uh, General Sisky is uh, ethnic Russian. So that he is um, he is obeying Zelensky's order without any uh, without any question. Uh, I, I posted on Twitter that it's for the moment it's not for me that it's like uh, finding the scapegoat, uh, finding somebody to blame because the, 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 front, the, yeah. front, the situation on the front line is is not going uh, is not going well, and uh, uh, somebody somebody that is not, let's say, ethnic Ukrainian from the Western Ukraine, but rather somebody that uh, has more connections, uh, medical connections with Russia, to, uh, it's look good if, if that person is, is blamed. Uh, General Sirsky, yeah, he's, he's a competent officer. He, he, he was brought in uh, and educated in, in the Soviet Union. Of course, he, at that time of the Soviet Union, he was the junior officer. He was not on the general staff, but uh, uh, he's doing what his job is. Now is is is, is that uh, going to change anything? Yeah, I, I, I saw some uh, comments that he's now going to blindly obey the orders. He is the general. Let general do uh, do his stuff. So uh, people now try make uh, making joke that he is uh, um, he lost uh, several battles. Uh, but we should look at that in some wider uh, wider picture. The overall status of Ukrainian military is that everything depends on the Western uh, donation and, and Western help. Uh, if that start, if that uh, that yarn that is connecting them, if this, uh, that yarn start to start to break, it it, it is going to uh, it, it will be like a domino effect. Nobody is uh, nobody is questioning the bravery of Ukrainian uh, defenders, but it's not the same army that uh, started the war in 2022. Casualties are huge, enormous. For, uh, for the country and uh, changing changing the, the strategic uh, uh, command, command structure you know uh, uh, Zelensky didn't fire only uh, Zaluzhny he, uh, he, all of his uh, deputies so it means that the command structure is, is, is shaking and you are not doing that in the, uh, in, uh, in the situation when your opponent is actually advancing uh, on, on the front line but it's not, not like a, a World War II, um, big pushes, big arrows. It's a grinding. It's a war. It's a war of attrition, which Russia is performing very well, excellent, because it's grinding Ukrainian um, uh, manpower. And uh, look, look at the situation in uh, Avdivka. It will be. It is cold one. There is one way. Only one. Uh, one line is open, enough so that the reinforcement can come. But it's it's attracting Ukrainians to, to put more and more uh, more and more troops there, and uh, Western resources. No matter how uh, people uh, think about that, they're not uh, limitless, and we, uh, we will see that in this war of attrition, the, uh, it's like like a box match. The guy who is standing last is going to win, and behind Russia there is a complete uh, uh, first people support that. The second thing, Russian Russian industry, Russian Russian military, it's 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 set up for this. And Russia is an Andre mentioned four hundred thousand people not introduced yet in, into the combat, but those people can uh, can be brought to the front line very fast. They're behind. Russia can can do rotation. Russia can put uh, can put reserves. Ukraine uh, Ukraine can do that. No matter how they're, they're trying to mobilize now five hundred thousand people, uh, hunting people uh, on the streets. That is not how how, how uh, war uh, should be uh, waged. So, so the, the time is not working for Ukraine, definitely. And uh, next few ne next few months will be, will be probably critical because uh, Russia has momentum, but it's not momentum on the World War II scale. 
It is slowly, but what is more important, steady. And yes. that steady, steady advance on the certain probing the enemy lines, uh, advancing here and there. Uh, if, if, they, if the troops need to retreat somewhere, yes, yeah, do, do that. But uh, it's it's constant. It, it, uh, this this war of attrition is something that is grinding Ukrainian uh, military abilities, and no changes, no changes in Ukrainian leadership. No matter who who they put, as Andre said, they can they can bring the U.S. general staff, and you know what? They're already there. Advisors are already there. They're living in the, in the uh, hotels in Kiev or even in the embassy. And there are advisors, no, not one or two. There are tens, uh, maybe even hundreds. They plan of operations. They yeah, plan they're operations they're from Rammstein. And that is one of the reasons why there's so much uh, screaming and squealing and propaganda because actually yeah. operational planning by the what essentially well United States doesn't have general staff they have the joint uh, chief, joint chief staff, staff, yeah. yeah and they basically what they, they do all different services from air force to navy to what have you land forces bring their plans they try to coordinate them but it's not general staff type planning yeah and uh what they do in Rammstein expose them as people who do not know how to really plan operations of scale and combined arms multi-domain operations Exactly. And this is why it is so damaging for them. They understand, many of them feel that, that they have been exposed. Because, hey, remember, they invented so many battles, which never happened. Just to give an example, <laughs> Battle of Kiev. Yeah, yeah, Battle of Kiev. Never happened. Never happened. Yeah. I mean, it was... Battle was... of Kharkov. It never happened. I mean, it yeah. hasn't been any battle there. Yeah, it and was then... just a bite. It was a perfect... Uh... Uh, operational uh, masking. Yeah, so the, it's the major like, attack yeah. is on south. Major attack is let's make a landline uh, from from the Crimean Peninsula to to, to, to Russia. Wow, so that was that, the, that was the major. That's that the point. It happened. it happened only in some some imagination. Uh, imagination, imagination. Yeah. <laughs> well, that is why uh, they their thing which bring me any of their generals. Then can he explain to me, or can he disprove me and Russian military professionals from the level of general staff who stated from the get-go, Russia never lost operational initiative Exactly it's, uh, from, from the start. And pe many people do not understand that by the end of May, by the end of May 2022, 2022, it was the uh, uh, barely two months, uh, uh, two and a half months after the start of the operation, uh, the armed forces of Ukraine lost the first iteration of their army. So yeah. it was completely destroyed and broken up. Yeah. So there you go. But because, again, you have to keep in mind, uh, most, uh, uh, all actually, American political and media so-called elites who are badly educated, highly uncultured people, uh, they view war from the point of view of Hollywood. I'm not exaggerating. I'm <laughs> quoting here uh, Major General Robert Latif, PhD in physics, 20 years in DARPA, in his book, and I'm quoting from his book, everything they know about war is from entertainment industry. It's not me. You can quote General Latif. Yeah. And he explaining that some senators do not even understand how you launch satellites or how you operate those systems. They have no idea. Same goes for the most American journalists. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. They are oh my God. practically militarily, they are morons. The only thing they know, <laughs> they think that the more you capture territory, and the longer is your dash in some point, the more it is just, you know, absolutely nothing. It has it means nothing unless you kill your enemy. And and again, as I already stated, in Clausewitz in terms, you compel the enemy to do your will. You don't have to dash to Kiev to compel the enemy to do your will. Absolutely. Enough to destroy armies. Yeah. And after that, you don't yes. dash or rush to Kiev. You march in. 
family Absolutely. without that's uh, that's the thing which people those yes. people and especially in washington dc they do not understand actually a number of american generals and so-called military experts they have no clue because they use this false yardstick that in 1991 uh u.s uh, military beat the you know bejesus out of the third rate semi-literate iraqi mm -hmm. army after the half a year of prepositioning forces with impunity <laughs> and all the military yeah. achievement. I mean, yes. uh, I I express it all. And well, my fourth book is about that. Yeah. I mean, those guys, they still think that they are good. Well, they are not that good. Let me yeah. put it this way. Absolutely. And some of, yeah, some of them, for example, take any, any American general, anyone, fresh from the today from the general staff and command college in the uh, uh leavenworth <clears throat> kansas for example they would know for example how to run the, the battle on the level brigade and above division and core because mm -hmm. they for example they don't have experience with the real air defense they have no mm -hmm. clue what it is yeah. they don't know how it incorporates itself they don't know how you integrate it operationally how it uh, affects the operations because well when you look at american air defense the only thing they have is a patriot and the next level down which is the troop air defense is of course sharad what is sharad sharad is a bunch of the stingers incorporated on some moving point yeah, yeah, exactly exactly so look at russian troops defense oh yeah it, it's, I mean, it's not it's not even the same universe. They have Tor yes. M2s, they have Panzers, they have books M1s and M3s and what have you. And so how do you operate if you're not taught how to deal with that? Yeah. They don't have even, that's why they failed in their operational planning. They planned yeah. again to fight the uh, Saddam Hussein's army. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They, should, they should read Isserson and uh, Trianda Philo uh, works. About well, operational art. Not only Trianda Philo. Yeah, yeah, read yeah, yeah. For starters, they read, uh, should read Svechen. His yeah. strategy, where he actually actually contradicts the uh, uh, destruction uh, uh, strategy of number is a son, you know, to Hachevsky and all. And he talks about the what? Attrition, exhaust, exhausting yeah. strategy, which you have to exhaust your enemy first. Yeah. And yeah. then after that, your big arrow offenses begin. Exactly. Well, guess what? This yeah, is exactly what happened yeah. in World War II. Operational art, simply operational art. Yeah. Yeah, very interesting uh, discussion. Thank you, guys. I have uh, two more questions. Um, the next one is uh, there is a lot of talk uh, in different channels and uh, media uh, about the uh, incoming Kharkov uh, offensive of the Russian army. Is it possible? Is it feasible? Um, do you think it will happen and how could it look like? Or is it only rumor? Difficult to say. There is a definitely movement towards Kupiansk and in general in Kharkov area, or Kharkov Oblast. So, but who knows? Russian general staff doesn't speak, and the right is so. So yeah, of course, there's <laughs> part of speculation. I don't speculate. Yeah, yeah, me too. Because you know, it's not World War Two that uh, we will have now big pushes surrounding the city. Because you know, taking Kharkiv is, I don't know, it's a, almost two million people. It's not the way how how, how thing is going to happen. But you know, when, when you put when you put the pressure on a different level of front, when you stretch the enemy, that is the point that he is not he's he don't know where you're going to attack, when you're going to hit. And when you hit on the multiple locations at the same time, that is the way how yes. you apply that operational art. And yeah. push the enemy, don't don't let him don't let him um rest. And, and but let him let him that small space that he can uh, maybe try to uh, try to retreat. Look look at what's happening in uh, Avdivka. They have that uh, that place to bring in uh, to bring the stuff, but also they can use that uh, to retreat. It is it is a pure attrition for me. And yes. in this war of attrition, Russia is uh, Russia has definitely upper hand. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay, yeah, thank you for that. Then the, my last question, I think uh, Lina has one more. Uh, but my last question is, what do you think um, um, about the situation in IFDFK? Uh, is it about to fall? Is it, uh, will the Russians keep it uh, several more weeks uh, for attrition? Or uh, what is your opinion? 
Classic. Uh, Andre. Uh, yeah, classic fire sack. You know, uh, luck it was in Bakhmut. Uh, uh, you just allow a little bit of opening. And there were a lot of, a lot of things similar of this nature. And I've been writing it from the start mm -hmm. of the uh, uh, special military operation. Fire sack. Uh, open the cauldron, so to speak. Let one side be open, and let as much as many as Mike correctly stated. Let the you know reserves come in, and you just kill them there. But in Avdivka, it's a little bit different because already now it seems like it has been split in two different cauldrons. So and they are just reducing them because by now uh, those uh, reserves are actually at the limit at the uh, for uh, armed forces of Ukraine. Hence this uh, practically uh, Hitler Jugend and Volkssturm type uh, attempt at the mobilization. Yes. That is why, for example, Silsky being absolutely butcher and you know the guy who absolutely doesn't care about uh, human lives was appointed to to conduct this, yeah, we will see the 16-year-old kids already there. We already have women fighting there in large quantities, large numbers. So Avdiivka probably will be, they will allow it to kind of boil a little bit more, but it's, yeah, uh, Russian already fight in the middle of, or in the center of the city, <laughs> so to speak. So, and now it's, a lot of it is done without contact because there's a lot of uh, those fabs, you know, those gliding bombs, smart bombs flying in. Yes. And they are, my gosh. Again, you have to keep in mind when this thing explodes, you, you can easily find it on internet. There is nothing to look at. It's just a huge explosion, okay? Yeah. Uh, it clears everything. It clears mines, you know, it clears uh, in the area. It just does, doesn't just kill the... Uh, uh, enemy soldiers. It kills their, uh, basically, their system of defense there. Again, it detonates mines which have been planted there. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, Avdiivka is pretty much done. It's, just the ma it's not the matter of if, it's the matter of how they want to reduce those pockets, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah, Avdiivka is, is, uh, is a fireback, so from three sides. Uh, Russian troops advancing, absolute air superiority, artillery, which is of utmost uh, importance, because uh, artillery will save all troops, and Russia has uh, complete dominance. And no matter how how much reserves, how how much kids they pick up uh, from this uh, this recent mobilization they send there, uh, they, they, uh, there is nothing that they can do. They, but they will not withdraw for, uh, from Avdivka because political reasons. Every military logic uh, uh, is, is a point that they they have to retreat. But, uh, but what are they going to achieve? Just just uh, sacrificing people. And of course, Russia is not going to push infantry uh, in, in uh, like a World War II waves. Artillery will uh, detect uh, any position, level it, then the scouts will go forward. Uh, gliding bombs are going to level any 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 support, so it is it is simply grinding grinding on bigger or smaller scale. But it's it, it's something that uh, definitely have you have only one outcome, and that that will be complete uh, defeat. Uh, but uh, you know it, it's it's hard to see because human beings are there. Both are Slavs. So they're, they're brothers uh, fighting brothers. That, that is the that is the biggest problem for the sake of somebody uh, sitting uh, far on the uh, far on the west but it is what it is so I don't think that Avika will uh, last uh, long but it, it will continue it will continue because this is the fire bag when Russia will simply attracting more and more Uk fresh Ukrainian units and bear in mind there is a limited number of reserves if they want to to, to achieve any if you want to achieve anything they have to to send three fresh uh, armor brigades just in the front line uh, then they, they will have they need to have six more brigades in reserve to exploit uh, uh, any, any achievement they don't have that that is the biggest yes. problem for them uh, yeah i remember so back then when it's done uh, oh, done deal yeah i think it's done deal Yes, I remember back then when uh, Prigozhin was calling the Ukrainian uh, troops into the Bakhmut um, uh, um, fire bag. 
Uh, but this was my last question. Thank you very much, guys. It was very interesting. I would like to hand over now to Lena. I think she has uh, one or two questions left. And yeah, thank you very much. Oh, uh, thank you, Alex. Well, I had one long question. It's quite philosophical, so I will save it for the better days. I hope Andre will come to us once more and not only once, but uh, I hope Andre will be visiting us regularly. And uh, one question I had from one of my good friends, it was like, uh, you know, a sarcasm of a sort. He, he asked, what next Wunderwaffe would possibly US send to the Ukraine after F-16 uh, failed there? The Death Star. So I think it's more of a humor, you know. <laughs> yeah, let me... <laughs> yeah, you, you know what? Uh... So far, those unbeatable, uh, sarcastically, of course, <laughs> quote unquote, Abrams uh, are seen only in the uh, in uh, Western Ukraine. They do not want to put them through the same fate as the um, leopards <laughs> and challengers. Uh, so, uh, yeah, they have nothing what they can send. Oh, they can try to send F 22s, that would be fun for Russian air defense and. Uh, like IS, which is Air Force, but uh, yeah, I am on the record. You can quote me. I wrote three books now, writing four. United States lost the arms race to Russia, simple as that. There is nothing in the US. Uh, the only capability where United States has an edge, and even that will be closed eventually, is the ISR, especially in terms of its the uh, uh, satellite constellation, especially which is using the commercial satellites for dual purpose. That allows the United States to do what it does, hiding behind the backs of the uh, Ukrainian soldiers, is to give them uh, basically the um, electronic, electromagnetic uh, picture of the battlefield. Mm -hmm. So that's the thing. Uh, but other than that, uh, when you look at this, my gosh, this is the whole of force now. And uh, there is nothing. They lost the arms race in missilery. And we, they lost it by not like years, by generations. Yeah. And we're not talking only about hypersonic weapons, which the United States doesn't have. Eventually, it will have it in some form. Uh, but it's going to be something which is the, the level of whatever is this dark eagle thing, you know. They try to make this gl glide body, glide vehicle. So not going to happen this year, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, and other than that, what else? I mean, we saw how the uh, U.S. air defense performed, don't, didn't we? So, and uh, they still assessing this damage to the first Patriot, which has been destroyed, I believe, on uh, March 18th, I believe, yeah, uh, 2023. Now. They still assessing the damage. They said it was minor. <laughs> so I don't know. They have this, you know, uh, crater there. So whatever they're measuring it. So that's it. Nothing they can send there. I mean, the United States simply doesn't have weapon systems which are comparable on the battlefield. We already saw what happened to the Holy Javelin. Their uh, basic assessment was about twenty percent effective. So there you go. There everything you need to know. Yeah, they're they're losing that that uh, that supremacy definitely, and uh, I'm quoting the title of your book. So that uh, that military supremacy that they had, uh, let's say, 1990s, it was uh, lo um, a lot of on a lot, a lot of on, on, on paper. But now, uh, you know, uh, they said, oh, people talk, uh, they can send F-35 or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's not just sending; they need to have somebody who is going to to maintain that stuff. You know, when we're talking about maintenance, I work on Leopard 2. I know Leopard 2 very well. That is, it is a very good tank, but it's very complicated. Not, uh, but if 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 you mention uh, M1, M1 is is a tenfold more complicated uh, than Leopard. Yeah. So, so if, if they sell Leopards, what are they going, going to to do with them? That tank is using gas uh, gas turbine, and that gas turbine need uh, need additional uh, tanker that that will uh, hold uh, the fuel for, for it. As Colonel McGregor says, when M1 drives, 
it is seen from the space in the <laughs> infrared because the earth goes yeah. above 1000 degrees i mean fahrenheit so yeah. uh yeah it's um how to say it yeah there's nothing to talk about and f-35 is the biggest boondoggle yeah. in the history of the military industrial complex so it's uh it's downright stupid you know so. yeah yeah f-35 is uh, such a box uh but they're still pushing with that. Okay, I mean, so be it. Sure, they will. Yeah. They will make Europe Europe pay for it. Yeah, so. yeah, of course. Well, we're paying taxes for for that. It's going, it's going to for that stuff. Yeah. Uh, thanks a lot for your uh, answers and for insightful discussion. And I have one more question. I think all our subscribers of Black Mountain Analysis would be very glad to hear. I know that you, Mike, and you, Andre, are writing new books, and could you speak maybe some words about your new books? Andre, please. Yeah, you first. Ah, okay. Well, it's... Um, um, I can give you the working title. It might change, obviously, but uh, it's the book about the America's final war. And this is about the fact that the United States not anymore. It never was really, okay? Because it was all contingent on the in the war in uh, uh, Europe, if, even against the Soviet Union, they knew they still would be defeated, but and it will go nuclear. But the point is United States is not continental power, and this has been proven. So in terms of America's final war is the war that it tried against their superpower, and it has been exposed. This is what my book is about. It obviously uses the examples from the special military operation, but it is primarily, not primarily, it's half of the book is about special military operation. The, the second half is about how special military operation exposed this all. And uh, it is for those people, uh, it's written for lay people who do not have background in military or anything to explain to them why that there is so much hysterical screaming on all fronts in Washington, D.C., because it has been exposed as a um, not ready. They didn't, and as the result, once the, uh, which is, of course, known, the my mythology of the American military might has been blown uh, to the smithereens, basically, the economics follows in terms of the dollar, which was basically resting on this mythology of the American military power. Now nobody is afraid of America. Yeah. So they oh, that's what special military operation did. Yeah, looking forward for for for, for that book. Yeah, uh, we got on, on my side. I finished actually with the uh, pen and sword. The two two books. One is uh, rockets and missiles over Ukraine. Uh, talking about uh, more of the technical stuff, what kind of rockets and missiles are engaged there, but also to the operations. And I, I, I saw the, the different comments, some uh, uh, talking, uh, some were very, very positive regarding to the, to, the, to the subject itself, but also that I'm talking more about the, the Russian side, like pro Russian. No, I mean, I'm simply talking about this is the real situation, no matter how it can be painful. This is the something that uh, that is really happening there, because we are on the West. We, uh, especially public, is um, prone to to believe everything that media said, but it's uh, in reality is completely different. So, um, and the other is um, defending Putin's uh, empire, but it's it's a very intriguing uh, subject, and it was proposed by the publisher, uh, because uh, empire can be uh, uh, can be looked at on the different ways. So, empire something. Uh, uh, I look at that, that the glory of, of, of the Russian weapons is actually something that exists and that will always exist. So that book, this book is covering uh, the uh, Russian uh, complete organization of Russian air defense, to the equipment, to the tactics, uh, to, to, the, um, uh, to the employment base. Uh, how was it uh, during the Soviet Union, especially how, how is it now? And we already spoke about that, uh, that multi-layered uh, defense, how that, how that is actually organized. So this book is actually covering the covering that 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 very very important uh, component of, of uh, overall defense, uh, and of course uh, shooting down the stealth fight, fighter. How we got that that guy, and it's nothing. Uh, there is nothing uh, magic in that. So that is uh, that is something that, that me and my colleague disclosed that 
Lieutenant Colonel George Anicic, co-author of the book. We disclose how we background how we got that uh, that plane down. So there is not there is no secret. Just good training, knowing equipment, and good uh, good tactics. Well, thank you very much for your insights, and we'll be waiting for your books to arrive. And uh, please let us know where can we find them to, and to buy them. And thank you very much. It was really nice to meet all of you. And uh, I, I will say goodbye here and meet you in a while. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.